so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The following episode contains discussions of domestic violence, murder and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. And if you or anyone you know is affected by domestic violence, please call 1-800-RESPECT. In an emergency, call 000. It was February 12, 2014. A hot summer evening, and 11-year-old Luke Batty was at cricket practice on a sports oval in the Melbourne suburb of Tyab. With blue eyes and dark blonde hair, Luke had just started Year 6. He was happy and empathetic, a best friend to his single mother, Rosie. Rosie was on one end of the cricket ground and his father, Greg Anderson, was on the other. After speaking to his father, Luke ran back over to Rosie and said, Mum, I haven't seen Dad for a while. He's asked me if I can have a few extra minutes. Rosie remembers thinking, that's nice. She had invited someone over for dinner and Greg had coaxed Luke over to the cricket nets. Suddenly, the park stood still in response to a sound of anguish unlike anything they'd ever heard. Her former partner, in what felt like the blink of an eye, struck his son with a cricket bat before stabbing him to death. In the hours following, Anderson resisted arrest and threatened paramedics with his knife. Police had no choice but to shoot. He died in hospital from both gunshots and self-inflicted stab wounds. What happened to Luke is a story that haunts Australia more than seven years later. In response, his mother Rosie Batty has dedicated her life to campaigning for domestic violence reform and has fundamentally changed the conversation about family violence. He was a little boy in a growing body that felt pain and sadness and fear for his mum. And he always believed he would be safe with his dad and he would have trusted Greg. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with former Australian of the Year Rosie Batty, who established the Luke Batty Foundation and launched the Never Alone campaign, which asks all Australians to stand with her and alongside all victims of family violence. She's also been named by Fortune magazine as one of its top 50 world's greatest leaders. Rosie, how did you meet Luke's father, Greg? When was the first time you met him? Just before I turned 30, I met him because I was working for a large recruitment company at that time. Recruitment was a very fast-paced industry. A lot of, we call them churn and burn. You know, a lot of people came in and out because it was a really demanding industry. So we were both in the sales team and he was, I think he was only there for like a few months But that's how I met him, yeah, as a work colleague. And what would you describe what your life was like at that time? Because you have spoken previously about losing your mother at a really young age. What was your headspace like? What kind of person were you in your kind of late 20s, early 30s? When I look back, I was a backpacker and arrived in Australia when I was 24 When I was 25, as I was travelling through Melbourne, I met my boyfriend, Steve, and he was in the television industry. It was heavy partying, a lot of alcohol, and he was a really fun guy and a really nice man. So I was very taken by him. So my travelling kind of halted and I got, you know, stuck in Melbourne enjoying that partying phase. So when I continued eventually with my travels and came back to Australia to live with Steve and apply for residency, so we were together probably about five years, give or take, and 
Steve's drinking problem became much more than a drinking problem. He was a, you know, full-blown alcoholic. And really, I had to understand that that was not going to change and I couldn't save him. So I had to leave and I moved into Richmond, which was like inner city, and I was working in the city. And so for me, this little country girl from a small village in England was really, you know, changing and adapting to a corporate power dresser in a corporate organisation in a sophisticated city. And I suppose, you know, when I look back, it was a huge adjustment. And I think I, you know, was still establishing friendships, which were largely coming through my work colleagues. And so I, I would say that I didn't have a deep sense of inner confidence, that I was I felt grateful almost for people to show an interest in me. And I think that when I saw Luke's father, I had no expectation of it being in any kind of permanent or ongoing relationship. I was attracted to him. He was a tall bloke. He wore a really good suit. He looked really impressive to my eyes because I'd always gone out with non-corporates, you know. So I, I guess I was drawn to that difference. And being drawn to that difference and feeling like I, after my relationship had finished with Steve, and it was incredibly difficult to extricate myself from that because I did feel his pathway was going to disintegrate. And it did, you know, it did. And I suppose I was feeling I need to make some changes in the choices I'm making with the men I'm having in my life. So that was how it started, really. And, you know, looking back, there were, there were signs that were saying to me from the very onset, this is not going to be a good relationship for you. But, you know, I was, I guess I'd never been really rejected in a relationship before. I'd always been adored by my boyfriends and I didn't understand certain behaviours because, I kind of kept trying to explain them to myself and then probably looked at it as, you know, being something wrong with me Mm. and kept trying to kind of, I suppose, make him like me because I couldn't quite accept rejection probably when I look back at it. What were some of the signs early on that maybe this relationship wasn't right? You know, this is a long time ago now, but I think... On my 30th birthday, I met with friends in a restaurant in Camberwell and afterwards we came back to my house in Richmond and my friends were so pleased for me to have a boyfriend and they all thought he was very suave looking and they were really encouraging and really pleased for me. But by the end of that evening, which went into the early morning, nearly all of them said, you need to get rid of him, he's a dickhead. And I couldn't quite understand what they were referring to, but really he'd hit on several of the friends in that evening or he'd said stuff to them that was either not funny but verging on blatantly inappropriate. And then at work, many of the girls and women had said, you know, Greg has said this to me or he's touched me. or And I would just, I guess I don't know why I didn't, see that as a total red flag. I don't understand why I made the allowances for that kind of behaviour. I certainly wouldn't now, not any way, shape or form. But I guess back then I was confused. I didn't quite know how to understand that. When I challenged him about it, he'd kind of dismiss it or deny it. I think a lot of women could relate with having that relationship. And as you said before, feeling as though maybe if you just worked a little harder and you were just a little bit better, then he wouldn't be looking elsewhere. And I know a lot of women who have had that experience. Could he turn on the charm? Like, was that part of what attracted you to him? He could turn on the charm, but I think also we weren't in an exclusive relationship, you know. So it was in the earlier stages of establishing is this going to go somewhere, you know, within those first few weeks and months? But when he thought I was interested in somebody else, that's when he initiated and said, you know, I think we should be in an exclusive relationship. And as soon as I thought, you know what, wow, 
I am meaning something to him. He's prepared to change because he likes me. I'm the one that he's decided has got those, you know, characteristics that he's drawn to and the others are going to just disappear. But as soon as I agreed to that, what he did was turn it around and then he went off with some other woman. So it was all incredibly confusing. The term gaslighting raises itself now, but I just found it incredibly confusing. I was incredibly hurt and I thought I've just got to get on with my life. So I do think that when you start to make allowances for people, when you start to make excuses and they've hurt you and continue to hurt you in ways that you're trying to suppress or deny of yourself, those are the signals that say this is never going to be a relationship of mutual respect, regard and care. This is never going to be a relationship if you can't totally trust somebody to always, no matter what, be striving to be there in your life it's really just about wanting the best for you. So working with each other, not holding each other back, not controlling each other, not putting each other down. And if there's any of that, it will always be a relationship that will not achieve its full potential or never give you the satisfaction. Do you remember the first time or around the period where the word abuse entered your head? Was there ever a period where you went, okay, I think this is worse than a bad relationship and, in fact, this could be abusive? Look, I think the first early stages of being in Greg's life, we were never a boyfriend and girlfriend. He would come in and out randomly and I'd always seem to get sucked back into him coming back into my life and it would only be fleeting and it would it would never be meaningful and off he'd go again and then you know finally to cut a very long story short you know I just said look I don't want to see you anymore I don't want you anywhere near me and if you are I'll call the police but I didn't see that he was being abusive I just felt it was a very unhealthy dynamic for me because I was being pulled down in that you know it was creating a lot of self-doubt within me. It wasn't healthy. It wasn't making me happy. And at some point, you've got to, got to say, well, I'm rebuilding my other areas of my life and I don't need you in it, actually. So I never saw him for, I think it was about eight years. I forget how long exactly, but it was an extended period of time. And then when he came back into my life, which was largely through a mutual friend who'd bumped into him, I was intrigued to see whether he'd lost his hair, you know, how bald he might be, how middle-aged he may look. I wasn't sure what had gone on in his life, where he was at, what he had been doing. So I was kind of intrigued and quite open to just catch up with him in the city because we always had a banter, always had a banter that I had not really experienced with many other people, you know. So as soon as I spoke to him, there was that intrigue again. And so I met up with him and very quickly we resumed the same dynamics again. But this time he seemed to be telling me that in that period of time he'd always thought of me. I was felt flattered. I felt special. You know, this is a man that treated me like crap earlier on and now he's seen the light. Now He's seen all the mistakes he made and he's a changed person, you know, and he's this, that and the other. So the warning signs would have been that he was living with the Hare Krishnas because basically what he was doing was he was homeless. But I didn't see homelessness like that. I saw homelessness with somebody on the street, very visible as you walk around the CBD and you see you know, unfortunately, a lot of homeless people. That's how I've envisioned homelessness back then. So this is a guy that presented still very well dressed, living in spaces that gave him dignity. But the reality was he still never managed to hold down a proper job. He didn't have a secure place to live. His relationships with everybody kept breaking down because he would sabotage all of them. So here we go again. Eight years later, this man still presented 
with dignity and style, but it was a facade. And I kept, again, this I can save him, I can rescue him thing that played out. And so, you know, we started seeing each other again and he was wonderful, very practical. And here I was as a single woman living on her own in an acreage block in a rural setting and I had worked really hard to maintain the place, paint it, you know, I, I love transforming things. And then in came Greg helping me. You know, he did so much work to help me landscape and get the block to, you know, I couldn't have done it without him. I just could not. So I was very grateful. And I really loved the way we worked on that together. You know, by then I was in my late 30s or nearly 40, I suppose. And it was really comfortable to find somebody back in my life that was working with me on these things. And, you know, I guess when I look back, I was again isolated, alone, lonely, missing family. I'd recently removed, come back from Sydney and I was still trying to establish myself. My friends in Melbourne had kind of started to have families. They were very preoccupied Mm. with their children, of course, and I was trying to fit back in again and struggling to do that. And so when I look at both times, I guess when he came back into my life was when I wasn't at my best. Did his behaviour towards you change when he discovered that you were pregnant? Can you remember what your relationship was like following that? Look, there were times within our relationship in those early stages where I would be very concerned about his behaviour sometimes out in public. Like you could see this kind of paranoia thing come over him and he'd be really unpleasant with other people but also how it clearly changed him something would come over him I would challenge him and what initially was a challenge and how we initially would argue it then became worse where I was then very intimidated I would say to him this is verbal abuse So I did have the words and I did realise that this has gone beyond just as having an argument. I'm powerless. I don't know what to do and this is not appropriate behaviour. So I would challenge him on that. And when I knew I was pregnant, around that time, there were certain things that cropped up and how he treated other people that made me really concerned. And I thought, my brother would never behave like this. My father would never behave like this. I really... I'm uncomfortable with the way he's acting and reacting. The reality of a relationship and the reality of where he was at probably with his mental health and his demeanour, I started to see through those cracks. He couldn't stop those cracks appearing. And as I challenged him and put pressure on him, that would respond in those, you know, really intimidating acts of violence back. But I didn't see it as that. Back then... I think I really felt that violence was physical. Mm. So if he aimed a punch over my head into the wall, I didn't see that as violent. I just saw that he's losing control of himself and I didn't see that as deliberate intimidation. And so it was really in those early stages when I went to a counsellor because I just was really distressed eventually they said, is Greg being abusive and violent to you? And I said, I don't know. And he handed me a sheet of paper and on this paper there was all the different forms of violence and I read them and I thought, oh, my God, it is violence. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with former Australian of the Year, Rosie Batty, about the loss of her son Luke at the hands of her former partner. Luke was born and you two were obviously extremely close. What kind of person was Luke? How would you describe him? 
He was a really good baby. I was like the wonderful breastfeeding mother. It was the most nurturing, rewarding, beautiful time of my life. I just didn't realize that when you give birth to a child, you become part of a club, a club that until you've had a child, people can't explain how that's going to change you, how it completes you, how you could possibly love something in such a way that consumes you. So you join this club, this invisible club, you know, where you're showing photos of your newborn, you know, all those people that you've known all your life who are parents genuinely are so delighted for you because they know your journey of this new life coming in and the rewards it's going to bring you and the sense of purpose and meaning. And so Luke was a great baby. I just adored being a mum. And Luke, you know, eventually he'd be that toddler that would, you know, whack another kid. But ultimately, overall, he was a good little boy. I'm sure most of us always say that. He was gorgeous. He was very sensitive. And as he continued to mature, he would cry quite readily. And I would try to encourage him that there is no shame in crying. Mm. And he was very sensitive. So he's like me. So there's a lot of characteristics I believe were like me. But ultimately, he did struggle being the only child in a single parent household. All our family are in the UK. We both did feel quite isolated. Often we weren't included in family get-togethers, you know, but we had our core groups of friends and those relationships that were really important. And Luke always wanted to have sleepovers. He always wanted to have friends and he'd get very, very hurt when he wasn't included. Yeah, it was he was a very sensitive kid, but he was also quite naughty at school. He was a chatterbox. He liked to be funny and disruptive. It was all, you know, quirky, fun behavior, but it did get him into trouble. But, you know, I'm still in touch with some of his teachers who, you know, how I feel really knew him Mm. in ways that maybe some of my extended family in the UK never really got that opportunity. So I was so proud of him. He was such a loyal kid. He'd write me little notes. He would, could tell when I was really a, sad or upset and he would know how to comfort me, which I felt was really, really sweet. Mm. Yeah, so he tried to be the rough and tumble kid I don't know that he was as rough and tumble as he tried to be, but, you know, young boys trying to find themselves, you know, they do a lot of that kind of play at school. And often it's a stage that a lot of kids go through. Were you worried about Luke's relationship with Greg? Because obviously you'd seen elements of Greg's personality that you had decided quite early this isn't a man I want living in my house and there needs to be quite established boundaries. Were you worried about how Greg treated Luke? No. Greg was actually great with kids. You know, it's easy for you to think perhaps because he killed Luke that he was just a horrible, evil man. But I think all of us, you know, we're not completely bad and we're not completely evil and we're not completely all one way. And so those elements of Greg that were endearing to me his humour, his intellect and things like that. There were things there that, you know, I could identify with and enjoy about him. And with Luke, he adored Luke. He was incredibly hands-on. He adored him. And he did a lot of things with Luke as he could that I could see were really positive, you know, that he would spend a lot of time with him. He would explore things with him that I didn't think to do and Luke adored him you know he could be very funny and good fun and you know it was nice to see some of Luke's friends doing the rough play with Greg and enjoying Luke's dad because they could identify and like him as well and so I think that I always knew he was incredibly protective of Luke We didn't always agree on some approaches and that would be difficult, you know, without going into too much detail. Greg did have strange kind of obsessions about certain things. Some of that was health-focused, some of that was religious. Some of that I could identify with to a point and kind of felt that was relatively okay. 
but you know his mental health was not good and so some of that was concerning but I would always be kind of just checking how Luke was and he always wanted to see his dad always wanted to go with his dad that changed over the last year or so what happened in that last year of Luke's life in terms of a change in the way Luke felt towards his father well Greg because of his living situation and his financial position and God knows what else was going on in his life because of course I never knew anything that was going on in his life. I just knew it would be chaotic. I knew he hadn't had a lot to do with or anything to do with his family for a long time. So his life got more and more isolating. He was living out of his car, you know, lots of things. So he wasn't in a position to have Luke much, which suited me brilliantly. So he would, you know, arrive here and just take Luke for a couple of hours to the beach or something like that. Or he'd do sports with Luke and take him to the cricket or take him to footy. And I thought, that's great. You know, that's just enough. They've got that connection, but he's not overly involved. He's not asking to have him overnight. He's not taking him away. Mm. So I was kind of monitoring, but okay. And then I got a lodger to move in here who was a man because I was struggling financially and so that gave me some extra income. As soon as Greg knew that there was another man living in this house, even though it was, of course, not a relationship, his behaviour became incredibly problematic and I just thought, I'm not having this anymore. I'm not having this anymore. So there was a number of things really that I started to put boundaries in and there was was an argument that erupted because of Luke and that progressed into him literally chasing me around the house with a weapon in his hand and that for the first time I was genuinely not sure what he was going to do to me. Mm. So it was crossing back into not just intimidating and I was stepping in because I didn't want him to talk to Luke in that way and it just escalated. He pulled me down by my hair. He stood over me on the ground. I can't recall what he did to me other than the manhandling and the pulling around and the pulling of the hair and stuff. But that was enough for Luke. You know, he was terrified and so I called the police. They came, they found him, they arrested him. They said to me, what's wrong with him? You know, like, is he on drugs or something? And I said, he needs his mental health checking. So they took him to Frankston Hospital. By then he kind of calmed down, talked to them in the way that they wanted him to, and they ticked a box and off he went again, which is very distressing Mm. because you needed mental health intervention. A man who was never accepting that he got anything wrong with him, that was clearly exhibiting behaviours, that were irrational, paranoia, you know, his whole lifestyle had been affected. And, you know, I'm very careful to reiterate that mental illness does not cause violence. That is still a choice and it's a choice that he made. But he did have all these other factors. You know, he was addicted to marijuana. He was mentally ill, clearly. And, you know, he wasn't going to engage. He wasn't going to engage and accept there was anything wrong with him. So after he went, Luke, I remember saying him, say to me, Mum, I couldn't do anything. I'm just a little boy. I said, you are a little boy, Luke. Mm. And that was something where I really was incredibly distressed that Luke witnessed something so frightening like that with me. And then he threatened me one day when he came and I wouldn't let him into the property and he was just at the gate. And he said, you think you'll outlive me in this lifetime, but I'll make you suffer. And so I had a really sick, ominous feeling. And I just picked up the car keys and drove straight to the police. And then Luke started to share with me and said, Mom, Dad's shown me a knife. Because he used to live in the car, so he'd have a knife to peel vegetables and stuff. And this is my memory. He said something like, I'm tired of this lifetime and it could all end with this. So as soon as I heard that, Luke kind of wouldn't or couldn't expand on that. Mm. I then started to think of all the difficulties Greg has been through in his life. 
he's always kind of come through them. But when you talk like that, you've got suicidal ideation. I was really concerned and I thought I could envisage him taking Luke and them committing suicide together in a car or something like this. This is where my mind was going. Mm. And so I went to the courts and one magistrate that really understood the risk more than I had even understood the risk. But my forensic psychologist started to say to me, Rosie, this man has mentioned a knife several times. You need to be incredibly concerned about this man. But they were concerned for me, never Luke. You know, and that's what she said to me after Luke. I never saw the risk to Luke. And because his threats were so subtle and he didn't make them all directly to me, it was when they all got pieced together that you started to see this pattern and this inevitable decline and all these red flags that we put together after Luke got killed, but no one puts them together at the time. So ultimately, I then didn't want Luke going with Greg. So, you know, you start the circus of the intervention orders and then making the charges of threat to kill. And, you know, then he doesn't turn up to court and then you find that the police haven't served him with papers because he's homeless and it's too hard for them to find him. And then you start to realise that you turn up to court with huge dread and anxiety and fear and no one's there and it goes nowhere and nobody does nothing. And then you realise this is another tactic because the longer it is where nothing happens kind of disappears yeah the police don't turn up you know and all of this so a year later nothing had happened no charges had been made because he never went to such and then I realized you know he started to understand bail and how to work bail and one day he was he turned up at the footy or whatever it was and I said what are you doing here you're not allowed to be here I said yeah I can be here now so he just knew to how to play all of this in a way that I didn't And I guess at the end of the day, he knows exactly what he can get away with, exactly what the police can't do anything about. And it's just that intimidation. It's that deliberate power game that he's going to continue to play. I had to work really hard on the police to take me seriously. And unfortunately, what I did learn is because I hadn't always reported the violence or the threats or whatever, I hadn't made enough complaints, so I never got introduced to the family violence special team. You know, so these things that you do that you go, what is the point of me involving the police about this? This Mm. is just exhausting, comes to nothing. I might as well just go back to handling it again myself. What can the police do? You know, you can't incarcerate somebody for what they may do when they're just always doing enough for it to not be serious enough, not be bad enough, just enough to disarm you, to make you feel powerless, to frustrate you, to upset you, to keep your life being in a state of flux. That's what they do. Yeah. That's what they do. They keep doing that. But unfortunately, because I took all his power away, because I reported every breach, I did everything, he had lost control over me. And you know, ultimately what I've always kept saying to people is when they would say, oh, ring the police or do this or do that, and i say, you have no idea because once I take control of this, once I start this journey, I'm going to be on my own. And where will everybody be? Because you're on your own. Mm. And that's exactly it. Once you start that journey of making them accountable, of reporting every single thing, The police can't be here seven days a week, 24 hours a day. No. And the unfortunate thing is when you take the power, you don't know. You don't know what could happen. And for many women, thank goodness, they will find a path and a life where they can move on Mm. and the violence is behind them. Others are murdered and I think that that's, you know, something I didn't understand at all was the risk to Luke. Now I listen to the words of what was said 
I realise now what he was saying. But you see, that threat to kill me would never have stuck Mm. because a year later, various organisations that were involved, which was Child Protection and Socket, which is a special police team that deal with children, they thought the violence was historic. Nothing had happened over the last few weeks or a couple of months. So, again, you know, violence never stops. It continues to escalate unless the perpetrator makes a choice. And invariably, they don't stop. They may move on to another unfortunate person and then you feel great relief because they're leaving you alone. But it's not stopped. And so how do we stop men continuing to use violence? It's something that we're still grappling with. And on February the 12th, it escalated to the worst degree possible when Greg did kill Luke at cricket practice. It's a story that I think is imprinted in the minds of many Australians. And you spoke the next day, I believe it was, about what had taken place. And that was the opening of a new conversation, I think, in the Australian public's mind. Finally, I wanted to ask you, when you spoke that day, What was it that you wanted to say? What was the crux of the message that you wanted Australia to understand about family violence and the way in which it does escalate? Well, I didn't have a script. I was in shock. Really didn't have an agenda. Didn't even think. But out of stubbornness, went out to greet the media because I felt it was me that should speak to the media to ask them to leave rather than somebody else do that for me. And what I really clearly said, which I have continued to reiterate, is that family violence can actually happen to anybody. And I think that, you know, here I am in a lovely neighbourhood, in a beautiful setting with a lovely house. It happens to women like me. It's not just Aboriginal women, women from low socioeconomic areas. It's not just a certain type. And that's really what I wanted to convey, that if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. You know, I I think we all feel safer when we think it's going to happen to somebody else. It's not going to affect my life and it's not people like me that this happens to. So for me, I didn't for a minute recognise Greg as someone capable of murdering his son. I thought those kind of men must have been horrible to their kids, cruel and evil people, look a certain way, act a certain way. Now, Greg was very well-mannered. He could be very engaging and humorous. You know, he wasn't evil in the entirety of what you would expect as a monster. He's a bloke, just like my other male friends. And I didn't think somebody I knew somebody I'd had a relationship with, somebody who loved his child and had been so attentive and kind and demonstrative with him, it's beyond my comprehension. It still is to think you could actually brutally murder your child. I will never understand how you can ever get to that place, and most of us can't. But it's these kind of acts happen all the time, and the common thing people will say is, This is such a quiet neighbourhood. Nothing like this ever happens. It doesn't matter where you are, what street you live in, what town you are in. That will be the thing. This never happens in places like this. And the community are shocked. They feel deeply impacted because, yes, it happens to every community like this because it's everyday people going through their everyday lives that trauma and grief happens to. And I think the other thing too is that I can look back now and, you know, a lot of my good friends, people who cared for me, people who were really at different times concerned for me, but certainly when I look back, we don't realise that we victim blame. We just did not realise that they put all the pressure on me to fix the problem and then blame me for not doing enough when there is only one person to blame, and that is Greg, who actually chose violence. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't realise, well, what can you do? You know, there isn't a magic 
solution here. You think the police and the justice system can change your life? Well, no, they can't and they don't. And there may be some good outcomes for some people and that's great to hear that those things happen. But for a hell of a lot of people, the system is as traumatic as the violence you're experiencing. The judgment and blame from a patriarchal system that is designed really to benefit men, it's still astonishing. And people don't believe it until they find themselves in that system. And as a victim, you work so hard to be believed. You work so hard for someone to take you seriously. So hard. I mean, when I this happened to me, breaches of intervention orders were not considered by the police. So you went to all the trouble to get this damn intervention order that everyone says you have to have. And then when you report a breach, they go, oh, well, you know, that doesn't sound very serious or that's not very worthy of our time or that's not going to stick in court or, you know. So ultimately go, well, if you're not going to make him accountable, what was the point of me going through all of this to get to that? But also, what message does that send the perpetrator when he knows I could get away with this? And the other thing that I guess still really upsets and infuriates me is, you know, all violence to any woman is abhorrent and wrong. But a woman who is attacked and killed on the street still has a very different response to a woman killed and murdered in her own home. And, you know, here we are again still judging people and women particularly for being out at the wrong time, walking on their own or blaming someone for wearing the wrong clothes. And yet you can be at home in one place you are supposed to be safe and you're more likely to be murdered there by someone you know. Rosie Batty is a leader in the crusade against domestic violence. Since being named Australian of the Year in 2015, she has passionately campaigned for change, not only in the way domestic violence is perceived by individuals, but also in Australia's judicial system. You can find a link to her book, A Mother's Story, in our show notes or at any good bookstore. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join. If you or anyone you know is affected by domestic violence, please call 1800RESPECT. In an emergency, call triple zero.